Welcome to English 2450 COM 2010, Intro to Film, Week Number 6, Lecture Video Number 2 on the Photographic Properties of Cinematography. In this video, I'm going to talk about the more kind of physical and photographic decisions uh, that a DP has to make about film stock and lenses when they are preparing to shoot a film. Another important physical property that uh, a DP would have to consider is lighting, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. You're welcome to go back and review those materials if you think that would be helpful. Now, one important admission here is that the more kind of technical and scientific pieces of cinematography, different lens types, different film stocks, I don't necessarily uh, consider myself an expert in any of those things because I'm not a DP. I'm not a filmmaker. I study film. I'm interested in film. But when you get to into the kind of nitty gritty of the industrial terminology, that's where I start to kind of lose interest. The important thing to keep in mind here, though, is just remembering how much expertise and how much work goes into making these choices that as a film viewer, you might not necessarily recognize or appreciate, but how much these things actually affect the end product of a film. So let's start by talking about film stock. Now, an important thing to keep in mind here is that not all DPs shoot on traditional film stock because we have this thing available today called digital filmmaking technology. So if you're a DP, you might choose to use digital cameras in which there is no strip of film. There's no strip of celluloid like this here that's going to be used. It's just, you know, a digital storage medium that's used to transmit the images. Um, not like, you know, this traditional kind of analog film stock. So this is only used by certain DPs. Another important thing to keep in mind here is that although a cinematographer might choose to shoot on a particular type of film stock, let's just say they want to use super 16 millimeter film stock, the film is still going to be edited digitally and it's still going to be projected digitally. Almost all films are edited using digital technologies and projected using digital technologies. Um, think about how difficult editing would have been before computers. You basically take this strip of celluloid, you cut it and you paste it back together, and you have to do that over and over and over again for a two hour long movie. Now that's incredibly difficult. Once you can translate this into a digital storage medium and use a computer program to edit, things become a lot simpler. So one important thing to keep in mind is that even if the cinematographer is like, you know, I don't like shooting on digital, I'm going to use a 35 millimeter film stock that at that point, this is translated into a digital storage medium and the rest of the film production process and distribution and exhibition is going to be in digital. So when I refer to film stock, the way that different film stock is uh, categorized is by the gauge, which is the width, the distance from one side to the other side of the film strip. So eight millimeter is the kind of the most narrow. This is for like uh, usually home video making. 16 millimeters a bit wider, 35 and then 70 millimeter. And 70 millimeter is where you start to get things like, you know, IMAX widescreen, et cetera. Another important thing to keep in mind here is that different brands of film stock are known for different qualities. So a director might choose Kodak over something else because they like the warmth of Kodak film stocks, because they all have a slightly different kind of chemical consistency, chemical makeup. The choice of film stock can affect things like the contrast, the color, the sharpness of the image, etc. So although I don't personally know a lot about why you might choose one brand of film stock over another or one gauge of film stock over another, this is something that a DP would think about because they really want to get a certain effect. So this is just an image of different types of film stock, different gauges. You see the wider gauges, something like IMAX or widescreen. Super 8 was used for like mainly, uh, mainly home, home movies. And this image is of Technicolor film stock, where these three different strips filter out certain light frequencies. And then when you stack them together into one film strip, they actually do show, um, you know, bright colors and kind of all of the uh, different parts of the color wheel. So uh, talking about color is really important when we think about film stock because, you know, at a certain point in film history, the actual film stock that was being used was black and white and did not show color, right? 
This isn't to say that color was only used in film once Technicolor film strips were developed. That's not necessarily true, right? So in black and white filmmaking, which was, you know, prior to 1940, almost all films were shot in black and white. Only 3% of major studio films were shot in color back in 1940. You know, by uh, nearly 1970, almost all films are shot in color. And today, if you're shooting a film in black and white, usually there's a very specific reason for that. Because on a technological basis, uh, shooting in color is far more accessible now than it's ever been in the history of cinema. Actually, shooting in black and white is probably a little bit more difficult to do today uh, because so much of filmmaking technology is based on the use of color. So if we're looking prior to 1940, and especially prior to 1930, um, black and white film strips were still altered after the fact to create the, uh, create the um, impression or the illusion of color. So even though the film strip could only capture images in black and white, that doesn't mean that color was never used. What they used before 1930 was called additive color. Now, an additive color system is exactly what it sounds like, adding color to a film strip after the fact, after the film has already been shot. Now, this is uh, something like tinting or toning or hand coloring the film stock. So tinting and toning are just slightly different methods for using dye. So you would dip the entire film strip in dye to change the overall color of it. And then when it's projected, you know, that dye projects sort of a, a blanket color across the entire image. And I have a good example of uh, tinting toning here from the film Nosferatu. So once uh, DPs realized that you could use dye to color a film strip after the fact, during the um, development process, they're started to develop these conventions, right? So for an image like this, blue tinting was used to depict nighttime, red tinting was used to depict firelight, and amber or yellow tinting was used to depict like the interior, like a bedroom in a house, for example. So uh, a film goer in the 1920s, 1930s would recognize this means nighttime. That's what that image is supposed to represent. Now, another additive color system that was used prior to 1930, and it's still sometimes used today, although not very often, is hand coloring, where someone would take a film strip and paint and a paintbrush, and they would actually color single cells of a film strip by hand, which is incredibly expensive and time consuming. So it wasn't used very often because it was just cost prohibitive, but that was one way in you know early filmmaking technology that you could have a color film was by tinting by toning and by hand coloring so color films actually go back to the very early 1900s i believe the first color film was like 1903 or 1904 possibly color films existed before that but have just been lost to time um subtractive color systems started to be developed after the 1930s into the 1940s and 50s things like technicolor which is where you filter out certain segments of the color spectrum, and then you kind of add those, um, those strips of film back together to build the color back up. So it's like I showed you in the previous slide. So subtractive color systems and additive color systems work slightly differently. One is adding color after the fact through tinting, toning, and hand coloring. The other is subtracting color by using a film stock that actually filters out certain parts of the color wheel and then layering those together like Technicolor film does. So now almost all films are shot in color, but even when films were mostly made in black and white, it's not like color was totally unimportant to the director or the director of photography. Because tones, tonalities, the difference in contrast in that black and white were incredibly important for the overall visual design of the film right? You don't want just a sea of washed out gray in your black and white movie. You want to have contrast. You want to have tonalities. And tonality can be controlled in a couple different ways, right? Tonality can be controlled during or after the shoot through the process of exposure. Now, exposure refers to how much light is able to either move through the aperture of the camera lens or is able to um, kind of hit the film strip during the um, during the development process. And if too much light uh, touches the film strip, 
then you get overexposed images, very washed out, very bright. If too little light hits the film strip, you have underexposed images where everything is, you know, kind of dark and, and not kind of easily seen, blurry, fuzzy, etc. So exposure during and after uh, the shooting of the film was important in terms of uh, affecting those tones, those black and white tones. Another thing that's really important in black and white movie making is that the directors and the DPs, the visual designers, art directors, all of these people work together to make sure that the colors on the set, so the costume colors, the set decor colors, all of these things actually translate to different tones on a black and white film strip. So even though the film's end product is going to be in black and white, the director might specifically say to the costume designer, I want this character wearing a purple dress because purple shows up better on black and white film than blue does, right? So color was actually very carefully controlled on set because color does translate into tone on black and white film. Even if we can't see that it's a purple dress instead of a blue dress, the way that it looks, the specific tonality of gray that it takes on the film is going to look slightly different. So that's important to remember too. Color has always been important to filmmaking, even in black and white films. Now, another important piece of kind of the physical decisions that go into uh, filming, you know, filming a, a given sequence or scene of a movie is the type of lens that's going to be used. You know, I'll admit that the very kind of technical um, specs on lens types is something that's sort of beyond my grasp, but I can give you at least a basic idea of what a lens does and different types of lenses. So, you know, the lens is obviously the curved piece of glass or translucent material that's the eye of the camera. It gathers light, it transmits it onto the film or onto the digital storage medium. So digital cameras also have lenses, right? All cameras have a lens. That's one of the basic pieces of a camera. And there are three main kind of categories of lens, wide angle, medium lens, and telephoto lens. Now, the difference between a wide angle, medium, and telephoto lens is a difference in focal length. Now, focal length is a very kind of technical term. I'm not going to expect you to, to remember focal length or to have to talk about focal length. But the important thing to remember about focal length is that it's the distance between the center of the lens to where the light rays converge, right? So essentially, if you have a longer focal length, it's going to flatten the image. And if you have a shorter focal length, it's going to exaggerate depth. So focal length is just kind of some technical terminology about uh, how the film or how the lens uh, kind of um, gathers light and transmits light. A wide angle lens is going to exaggerate depth and distort the lines at the edge of the frame. Medium lens is going to avoid any noticeable distortion of perception. This is going to be kind of your standard lens that's used for most things. A telephoto lens is going to flatten space and bring objects and figures closer together. Now, telephoto lens is what you would use to shoot like, um, like a football game, for example. You want to show the entire field as one kind of big flat space. A wide angle lens or an extreme wide angle lens is called like a fisheye lens. And that's meant to kind of exaggerate depth and make things look kind of wonky or strange. A zoom lens allows for you to adjust between different focal lengths. So if you have a zoom lens, you can move from wide angle to medium to telephoto. So a couple different examples of what this looks like in practice. I have an example of an image taken with a wide angle lens here. And you can see that the edges of this photo are almost bent, right? This looks kind of like it's creating the circular effect and it really exaggerates the depth of this space. So this is wide angle. It widens the shot, it distorts the edges, it makes things look very kind of deep. A telephoto lens is different in that it flattens this space, right? All of these things almost look like you're, they're virtually the same distance away. And that's uh, part of the effect of the long focal length is that this image is flattened and it distorts movement towards the camera. So in this scene in The Graduate, this character is running towards the camera, but it doesn't look like there's ever, they're ever getting any closer because the telephoto lens makes everything look very far away and flat. So these are just some different basics of film, uh, of film lenses and how lenses are used for different effects. In my next video, we will be talking more about framing. So uh, stay tuned for my next video.